Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Whenever you're watching this virtual service, we're so glad that you're choosing to spend some time worshiping God with us here at Brighton United Methodist Church. Welcome to our virtual worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent, December the 20th, 2020. As we begin, we want to just make sure that you're finding your way connected to us here at the church. And that happens in a couple of different ways right now. Uh, first of all, I want to direct your attention to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com. There you'll be able to find out all the information of our ministries and how to contact the church, how you can remain connected with us and plug into all that we have to offer. We also want to encourage you to find us on Facebook, where you can uh, check in on the midday prayer break, uh, Monday through Friday at noon, where you can look up events that are happening here at the church, including our virtual Bible study that continues to meet on Tuesday mornings. And uh, in fact, you can get all of the information and the inspiration that you'll need to get through your week together with us. Now, this being the fourth Sunday in Advent, we've got some very special offerings coming up in the next week. And those begin tomorrow evening with the Blue Christmas Service. Our virtual Blue Christmas Service will go live on Facebook and on YouTube at 5 p.m., uh, offering you an opportunity to, uh, to, to rest in the presence of God. Maybe you're not feeling the holly jolly nature of this season because of a grief, maybe a loss of a job or a loss of a loved one, or maybe you're just feeling down. Whatever it might be, join us for that Blue Christmas service at five o'clock. It goes live tomorrow evening, uh, December the 21st. And now fast forward to, uh, to um, Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, we are going to be gathering here in the uh, prayer garden for a brief and uh, likely chilly uh, outdoor candlelight Christmas Eve vigil. We'll read the stories of Christmas, we'll light the candles, we'll uh, listen to a carol, and we'll take communion. And we want to invite you to bundle up, bring your mask, and join us for that uh, candlelight vigil, if you're feeling comfortable, in our prayer garden here at the church. Uh, we also will be offering drop-by communion, where you can drive into the south uh, entrance and we will come out and provide you with communion. We've got a little gift for kids, and uh, if you ordered a poinsettia, you can pick your poinsettia up at that time as well. Uh, just let us know when you come. Uh, that will be offered from the end of the candlelight vigil, uh, vigil through uh, five, or 6.30 on Christmas Eve evening. And then at 7 o'clock p.m. on Christmas Eve night, our virtual Christmas Eve service will go uh, live on Facebook and on YouTube. And I pray that you will join us, if not at, uh, during the premiere, at some point uh, in the next week. You'll look in on the virtual Christmas Eve service. Join us in celebrating the birth of Christ. Now for that, you'll need a candle. So be sure to, to uh, pick up a candle or, or dig one out of a drawer or be ready because uh, even though we can't be here lighting our candles, the light of Christ will still find you even in your home. And now we make the transition from information to inspiration. As we enter into the presence of God, we are invited into the atmosphere of worship. Let us pray together. O oh God, who prepared of old the minds and hearts of humanity for the coming of your Son, and whose spirit ever works to illumine our darkened lives with the light of the gospel. Prepare now our minds and our hearts, we ask you, that Christ may dwell in us and ever reign in our thoughts and affections as the King of love and the very Prince of peace. Grant this, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We find ourselves once again lighting the candles of the Advent wreath. We're reminded that this journey began with a reminder of the hope. Anticipating the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We moved on to love. Remembering the love that God gives 
to the world in the gift of Christ. We then remembered joy. The joy that God brings and enlightens our life. Today, we speak of peace, and we hear from the Word of God from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed her. We round out our four Sundays of Advent with a sense of God's peace that passes all understanding. The peace that comes upon a young woman encountered by an angel whose life is upended by the news that she will be the mother of our Lord and Savior. We light the candle of peace. Let us pray. Eternal God, as Mary waited for the birth of your Son, so we wait for his coming in glory. Bring us through the birth pangs of this present age to see with her our great salvation in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we've come to that time in our service where we invite the children and youth down front for a children's message centered around our friend here, God's Mystery Box. Today we have an entry from Adeline and Carter who send in a picture of a, a Christmas bear reading a Christmas story. How could we see God in this stuffed bear with a Christmas hat reading a Christmas story? What do you think? How do you see God in this? Have you been practicing? I hope you have. And I would love to hear how you could see God in uh, this bear today. Now, as I think about this time of year, I think about all the wonderful stories that come. The stories of Santa Claus and his visit. The stories of Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph. The stories of, of 
the Grinch. I think of the beautiful stories that come to us from our Bibles that tell of Jesus' birth, right? The journey from Nazareth to, to Bethlehem, the, the shepherds encountering uh, angels singing praises to God and telling them that Jesus is born, the wise men following that star those many miles just to bring their gifts and to worship the child, Jesus. So many great stories this time of year. Do you know those stories? Have you read them before? I want to invite you to have your parents read those stories to you. We love to read those stories of Santa and Frosty and Rudolph. But have your parents read to you the stories. Or if you're old enough, read them yourselves. Go find them in the Bible and read those stories of Jesus' birth for yourself. Those are precious stories that draw us to God. And when I see this bear reading a story, I think of those beautiful stories. Those beautiful stories of how God gave us the greatest gift we could ever get. Jesus. Now, if you would like to bring for a future virtual worship, all you have to do is pick something from around your house, take a picture of it, and send it to me at revkershaw at gmail.com. We've got a couple already in the queue, and we will love to add any picture you send in. And then watch these virtual worships in the upcoming weeks so that you can see what you bring for God's mystery box, okay? All right, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you we thank you for making us a part of your story, for sharing your love in the baby Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the love that you share with us each and every day, but especially the love you share through these beautiful children. Lord, we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We begin our time of prayer today with a prayer of confession. Confession is where we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives to reveal any way in which we are falling short of God's glory through sin. When we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we respond by confessing our sins to God. Then we turn from our sins embracing afresh the forgiveness of God, the forgiveness that God is more willing to offer than we ever are to confess or repent. We will join in a general prayer of confession, followed by a moment of silent prayer, giving you a chance to lift up your confessions to God. And then we will come back together again, embracing the forgiveness of God afresh. Let us pray. O oh God, we confess the blindness that is not even aware of sinning, the pride that dares not admit that it is wrong, the selfishness that can see nothing but its own will, the righteousness that knows no fault, the callousness that has ceased to care, the evasion that always tries to make excuses, the coldness of heart that is too hardened to repent. God, we are sinners. Be merciful to us. Well, our God is mighty to save and faithful to forgive. So may Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and strengthen us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit all our days. Amen. And now, dear friends, 
Even as we have received afresh the forgiveness of God, we join our hearts and minds and voices together in declaring our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come into a continuation of our time in prayer, we want to invite you, if you have a joy or a concern that you would like to lift up in the body of Christ, we encourage you to take advantage of our prayer email address at brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. When you send in your prayer requests there, they come directly to me. And when they do, I lift them up in prayer, and then I send them along to our prayer warriors that we might keep you in prayer throughout this week. If you would like to be a part of our Prayer Warrior team receiving those email updates, it's as easy as going to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com and uh, scrolling down a little bit, you'll find the link to our MailChimp sign-up where you can enter your email address and receive all of the prayer requests that come into us. However you do it, please give us the privilege of praying with you and praying for you. Together, we will contend for your breakthrough in the mighty name of of Jesus. And now on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we enter into a time of prayer. I offer a prayer of peace. Let us pray. Creating and sustaining God, we come before you in prayer in the midst of a busy season. So much to do, cards to send and presents to buy, gifts to give, cookies to make, friends to catch up with, family to plan for. And Lord, on top of it, we are struggling through this season of pandemic and separation, of fear and anxiety about health. Lord, it can all seem so overwhelming. It feels like the opposite of peace. We feel like, Lord, sometimes if we could just pin down all of the things we have to do, if we could just organize our lives and, and get things under control, that we would find peace. But Lord, we know in the midst of our struggle that our peace, our true peace, comes only from your mighty presence. Lord, draw our attention in this season, in this week, in this moment, to the anticipation the birth of your son, the one who ushers in a time when your presence would be felt more powerfully than ever.
Lord, we celebrate as we live and follow you on this side of the cross that we have received your Holy Spirit presence that you have made for us a dwelling place in our hearts. Lord, we pray that in the bustle of this time, you would bring a sense of your Holy Spirit more powerfully. That it would bring us that peace that passes all understanding. That we might rest in your presence and prepare our hearts to celebrate your birth. We pray these things in the mighty and powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one who taught us how to live and the one who shows us how to love and the one who brings us together in prayer as we now join in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
favorite part about Christmas is my Christmas tree, and I hope that your tree is just as pretty. Merry Christmas! Hi, my name is Micah, and my favorite thing about Christmas is giving gifts, and I'd like to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Hi, my name is Isabella Perkins, and what I like about Christmas is spending time with family and friends. I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and my favorite thing about Christmas is driving around and seeing all the lights. Have a very Merry Christmas. Hi, my name is Abigail Perkins, and my favorite thing about Christmas is seeing everyone be happy. I hope you guys have a very Merry Christmas. Hi, my name is Eli, and my favorite thing about Christmas is seeing all the snow. Merry Christmas. Hi, everyone. I'm Libby, and my favorite part of Christmas is seeing my family. Have a very, very Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's doggy for saying Merry Christmas. I'm Deb Friedholm, and my favorite thing of Christmas is just all the friendliness of people around us and just the greeting, greetings that we have. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas at the Christiansons. Merry Christmas to all my church friends and family. Today's scripture comes from 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 11, and verse 16. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant, David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I was brought up by the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all of the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel? whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all of your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly from my time that I appointed the judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, far from the secular countdown to Christmas, Advent, as we have been discovering over these last four weeks, Advent is a season of waiting. And so we have been. We have been waiting, haven't we? We are now three full weeks into our season of waiting and hopefully growing ever closer to an understanding of how we are to wait faithfully. It can be so hard, right? It can be so hard, but so far we've talked about how we are to wait. <clears throat> we've talked about waiting with patience. Oh boy, is that hard, right? We've talked about the end of waiting. So far we have talked about waiting in terms of anticipation, right? The time our anticipations grow while the arrival of what we wait for is delayed. Think about, uh, think about Christmas, for example. Right? Think about when you were a child and having kids at home brings this to vivid memory as uh, I think back to being their age, the age of my boys, and what it was like to anticipate Christmas, to wait for that long month when the tree goes up and then tr 
presents start to, uh, to come under the tree and things build at church and busyness gathers into eventually that Christmas Eve and Christmas Day celebration. Think about Christmas, right? We've talked about waiting in terms of anticipation, right? The time our anticipation grows while the arrival of what we wait for is delayed, right? There's that sense of, of waiting, that sense of waiting, but it has an end. We know what we're waiting for. There is a kind of waiting, though, where we know what we are waiting for. It's coming is just delayed, right? Much like Christmas morning, we know what we're waiting for. We know that we're anticipating the birth of Christ. We know we're anticipating the presence under the tree. We know we're anticipating that glorious celebration. We know what we're waiting for, but its coming is just delayed. That's one kind of waiting. And that's been the, the, the focus of our uh, series on waiting so far. But sometimes, sometimes like the coming of our modern celebration of Christmas, we, we have a defined end, right? We must only endure we must get through December, or uh, if you're uh, a little more enthusiastic, maybe you've got to get through November and December. And, and if you're uh, in retail, you're probably trying to get through October, November, and December, right? But you know it's coming. And yet other times, other times we know what we're waiting for, but not when it's coming. Not when it's coming. We, we know what we're waiting for, but not when it's coming. That's been uh, another topic we've touched on. Right? The coming of Jesus. We know we're waiting for Jesus' return. As followers of Christ, that's what we are anticipating. That's what the first few weeks of Advent are really all about. Is that anticipating Christ's second Advent, right? The return. But as Scripture is fast to remind us, and strong to reinforce in us, nobody knows when it will happen. And so we wait. Well, there is yet another kind of waiting. How many kinds of waiting could there be? There is another kind of waiting, but this kind is not about us waiting on God, but instead, God waiting on us. For that, we turn to this, what seems perhaps somewhat out of place story from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's, uh, let's set the stage here for us a little bit. This is a, a story in the life of King David, right? David is anointed king as a small boy, but it's years before uh, he ascends to the throne because he faces fierce opposition from the first king, Saul, who falls out of favor with God, leading to the anointing of David in the first place. David is anointed a small boy and has to wait for years as Saul not only occupies the throne, but actively pursues and opposes David himself. The kingdom is finally united under David's kingship. All of the tribes of, of Israel come together acknowledging that David is the rightful anointed king of God's people. And... David has now, in chapter 6, brought the ark into Jerusalem. In fact, we just read that story in the midday prayer break this past week. David brings the ark of the covenant, the presence of God that traveled with the people of God through the wilderness and came with them into the promised land that led their way and assured them that God's presence was with them, is now in the holy city of Jerusalem. And here is where chapter 7 begins. David, David gets himself an idea. He, he will build a house. He will create a temple to his God. The God who has been traveling around with the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle, the tent, around with the people, David, David is going to build God a house. We hear how this goes at the beginning of chapter 7. Now, when the king was settled in his house, the king was settled in his house, right? And the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies. The king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays 
in a tent. And Nathan, the prophet, said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. I just want to note that not only does David get the idea to build God a house, but Nathan, Nathan the prophet, initially greenlights the idea, right? Go and do what all, all that you have in mind. David is clearly concerned that he lives in a house of cedar and God lives in a tent. And so he wants to build a house. Now, why does David want to do that? To be frank, David likely wants to do that to make a name for himself. All of the other peoples that he has conquered, that he has faced as a great warrior among God's people, they all have temples to their gods. But David's God lives in a tent. Got a little bit of a divine inferiority complex going on here, right? Even though David is a man after God's own heart, sometimes David is a man after his own heart, frankly. And so he's going to make a name for himself. He's now uh, solidified the kingdom. He's established Jerusalem as his capital city. He has brought the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, into that capital city. And now he's going to make a name for himself by building a temple. And Nathan, the prophet, initially greenlights the idea. There's only one problem. There's only one itsy-bitsy, teensy-weensy, little hiccup of a problem. God, well, God had other plans. God had other plans. Picking up in verse 4. But the same night, right? Nathan says, go and do it all you have in mind. That same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build a house to live in, for me to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought you up, the people of Israel from Egypt this, to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Whenever I have moved about among the peoples of Israel, I did, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? You can hear God just bristling at this idea of David's, right? David's got himself an idea, I'm going to build a house for God. And God's like, did I ever say to do that? Did I give you any indication that I wanted you to do that? How often do we, you and I, make our plans and then take our plans to God and ask God to bless them, only to wonder why God is taking so long with our plans? You ever, you ever experienced that? Have you ever awakened to the reality that that's happening in your own spirit? That you've created a plan and you've started executing a plan and you've taken your plan to God and suddenly you're angry at God for not wanting to go along with your plan? Think of David and his plan. And God saying, did I ever tell you to do that? Did I ever tell you to do that? I came across a, a, a vivid experience of this most recently, as a matter of fact. Earlier this week, I was here at the church doing one of the many recordings that I've been doing this month for uh, the celebrations of Advent and Christmas. And I was recording some uh, lengthy videos for uh, what was to become our Blue Christmas service. I had made some Blue Christmas plans, and I spent um, half a night, well into the night here at the church, recording the videos to execute that plan. And then the next day, I went home to my home office and I began to uh, transfer those videos from my phone, where I make the videos, to my computer, and it was taking a long time. And so while I was taking a long time, I was spending some time with the Lord and just thinking. And the longer it took, the more uneasy I became until by the time all of those videos uploaded onto my computer, I was certain that God had other plans. I had made some rather clever and and uh, extravagant plans for what I was going to do for the Blue Christmas service. And I had gone so far as to execute half the work to do it, only for God to say, hold on, was that my plan or was that your plan? And so back to the drawing board, I had to go. You'll see the results of that back to the drawing board tomorrow as we premiere the Blue Christmas service tomorrow evening. It is so easy for any of us 
it is so easy for any of us to mistake our plans for God's direction. And God will patiently wait. God patiently waits, much like the father of the prodigal son, waiting with an eye to the road, looking for that time when we will return, not asking God to bless our plans, but waiting for us to receive the plan from God. This was David in this moment, right? David in this moment, he's living high. He's, he's not only vanquished his uh, uh, opponent in Saul. He's taken uh, the throne and now he's united the kingdom. Now he's brought the, the, the presence of God into, into the, the holy city he wants to establish as his capital. Everything's going great. He's sort of, he's sort of on a roll, right? And he's like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a house. And Nathan, frankly, the prophet of God, he was no better. He didn't go to God and say, yeah, let me, uh, let me check that out, David. Let me take that to God and I'll get back to you. No, no. He said, go and do whatever you've thought about. This sounds like a good plan. Nathan's no better. My planning for the blue Christmas service is evidence that I'm no better at this than you are. Often God is waiting on all of us to get on his plan. We will cling to our plan, though, won't we? We will cling to our plan, and oftentimes to our own detriment, right? We'll cling to our plan even though things aren't going right, even though things crumble and fall down. But what we don't realize is that God is waiting for us. God is waiting for us, waiting until we realize that God's plan is always better than ours. I know that sounds like an obvious point, but God's plan is always better than ours. After rebuking Nathan in verses 4 through 7, God begins to reveal to Nathan and through Nathan to David God's better plan. Check out God's better plan. God starts this better plan by reminding David why he should trust that God's plan is better. And why should he trust that God's plan is better? Well, first of all, beginning in verse 8, he says, Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time when I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Okay? God begins by reminding David why he should trust that God's plan is better. And it begins by rehearsing what God has already done in his better plan. God anointed David from obscurity to be the prince over my people. That doesn't happen. A small shepherd boy doesn't become ruler of God's people without God involved, right? That's, that's in verse 8. Then in verse 9, God begins to lay out the reminders, right? God was present with him everywhere he went. And he finishes that verse 9 with a reminder that God protected and defended him against all his enemies and drove them out before him. God begins by reminding David just how much he should trust that God's plan is better. God's plan is better because God's plan has always been better. Then, then God pivots and God begins to reveal the better plan. God begins to reveal the better plan, right? As we go from verse 9 into verse 10, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed. Evildoers shall not afflict them as they formerly did. 
from that from the time that I appointed judges over the people of Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. He's he's saying, I'm going to plant you in a place. You're going to have a place, and I'm going to protect that place. I'm going to protect you from your enemies, and I'm going to drive out evildoers from before you. God will plant his people, and God will protect them. God begins to reveal this better plan. Sure, David, you're feeling pretty pretty good right now. You've got your capital city, but I have bigger plans. I have better plans, God says. I'm going to plant my people, and I'm going to protect them from their enemies. But it gets even better than that. It gets even better than that. God begins, uh, God ends by revealing the ultimate plan. Check it out. The second half of verse 11, he says, Moreover, the Lord declares to you, David, that the Lord will make you a house. The Lord will make you a house. What does that mean? What does that mean that the Lord will make you, David, a house? Well, look at verse 16. We jump from 11 to verse 16 and God reveals, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God will make David the person into the first of an eternal line of kings. A line of kings that would rule over God's people forever. A line ending in the culmination of Jesus Christ. This line This house of David culminates in the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. Look back to the passage of Scripture we read as we lit our Advent wreath today. That beautiful declaration from the angel told to the virgin named Mary, right? Engaged to the man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, remember? And look what the angel says about this child to be born. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. Now, who is this Jesus going to be? He will be great, verse 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. God reveals the better plan, better than David could ever imagine. David had a plan to make a name for himself by building a house for his God. But God had a plan to make a name for David and his house that would redeem all of creation. God's plan isn't just a little better. God's plan is always extraordinary, extravagantly better. The lesson for us is that God's past faithfulness gives us confidence that God's future faithfulness is better than any plan we will ever make. And if you find yourself making plans, and you find your plans frustrated by waiting on God, perhaps you might consider that God is in fact the one waiting on you. Is God waiting on you? If he is, you better ask for his plan. Amen. You ready for your homework? I hope you are. I hope you've been doing your homework, even in this busy season of Advent and all the bustle. We want to encourage you to uh, apply the lessons of our, uh, of our message today to your everyday lives. We're not about the theoretical here at the church. We want to make things as practical as we can. And so I want to encourage you uh, to begin by applying the lessons through the Thirsty 30. We, uh, 
we dedicate ourselves to 10 minutes of Bible reading, 10 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes of worship, 30 minutes to God each and every single day. Now, see that as a baseline. If you haven't been doing any of these, pick one this week and get to it. 10 minutes each and every day. Now, if you've been doing some of it, but you haven't gotten to 30, maybe you flirted with 30 or even been there a few times, you just haven't been consistent, I want you to make a plan. What have, what have I been saying? In, in a busy season like Advent, you're never going to get there without a plan. So make a plan and get to that. Dedicate yourself 30 minutes to God each and every day. And if you've been doing that 30 for a while, I want to encourage you to challenge yourself. Give a little bit more to God. You will never regret giving more of your day to the God who gives us every day, okay? Now, while you're in the midst of doing your, 30, your thirsty 30, I want to give you uh, a little bit of a prayer assignment, another one of those dangerous prayers that we give you today. Come to God in prayer this week as you do the thirsty 30, and I want you to ask God to reveal what plan are you waiting on. What plan are you waiting on, right? You've got a plan. You seem to be waiting what plan are you waiting on? What plan are you trying to execute that seems frustrated? And then I want you to ask, is God really waiting on you? Is God really waiting on you to get on his plan? And if the answer is yes, even a small yes, seek the Lord about how to fix it. Okay? It's a tall order, but you can do it. Even, even in this week leading up to Christmas, you can do it. Okay? Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we entrust our plans to you. Lord, we admit that we try to dictate to you what the plan should be, but we want to hear your voice. We want you to guide our steps. We want to be on your plan, for we know it will be infinitely greater than our own. Lord, help us. Arrest our plans and bring us to know your plans. Bring us into your immense and amazing blessings. Help us to receive afresh the blessing in this coming week, the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we, the body of Christ, and as we as individuals seek to listen to God's still small voice guiding us in our lives, we know that God is guiding us into lives of generosity. God calls on us to give, not because God has need of our gifts, for he is God, but because God knows that you and I have need to live in generosity sharing with one another the blessings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you would like to make a donation to our uh, ministries here at the church, you can do that in a couple of ways. We want to invite you to send us your uh, donation in the mail. We do, in fact, get the mail. You can log on to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com forward slash donate and make your donation there. Or you can even set it up with your financial institution to send us your contribution automatically. However you do it, first I want to thank you for your generosity in this strange year. And I want to thank you and encourage you to continue your generosity as we approach a coming new year. However you do it, let us give generously. Now, if you find yourself in need... Uh, in this holiday season. Perhaps you've lost your job. Perhaps the recent uh, closures have left you with hours cut. Maybe you've just found yourself in a financial bind, whatever it might be. We here at the church have an emergency assistance fund that's specially designated to help those in need. And so we want to help you. If you have a need, reach out to us through our prayer email address at brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. Describe your need, and we'll do what we can to help you in this time. Don't let shame or embarrassment prevent you from reaching out. Give us the privilege, your church family, of helping you in your hour of need. 
And now, may we give, give generously to the giver of all we have. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for all you have entrusted to us. We give out of that abundance to the ministries of this church and to your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you would bless these our gifts, that they might go out into the darkness of this world, shining the brilliant light of your Son, Jesus Christ. May you do it through us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. of this time to the worship of our everyday lives. May you go to share peace with all you meet. Go listening for God's still small voice guiding your steps. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.